What I thought I'd start with, Tom, uh, and you know, we'll, what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the work in this exhibition, and then maybe talk a little bit more generally about Tom's practice. Um, but before talking about the works in the show, I, I really wanted to talk about the work that's not in the show, but that gives the show its title. Uh, and that's one that we haven't talked about. <laughs> uh, could you tell us about it? Um, well, it's my hand, and it's, um, it's life-size. Um, so the drawing is life-size. Uh, it's ba I've always had a kind since childhood. I've had grown up a Catholic. Um, your I've always had an identification with Doubting Thomas just because the name. So when you hear the n your name in church or whatever, you kind of oh, there's a character you can identify with, and in a way, um, and it's about. So I've always been interested in pictures of Doubting Thomas and about the idea of him sticking his finger into the risen Christ and it's about evidence so it kind of in a way uh, a lot of my work is kind of about evidence about maybe examining sources examining things which you take for granted in the real world whether they're photographs or text or stamps or whatever and um, so there's kind of a to me it's it's a self-portrait but the finger is gone and often i think um I kind of feel I point the finger in some of my work as well, so I can't, it's like, I'm not, I can't point my finger, finger is gone, so what's left to do? Because I think work, maybe in the last few years, you kind of get maybe a bit angry about the state of the world or whatever, and you kind of feel like you're pointing your finger at, at whoever. And it's also then, I suppose, um, it's John Baldessari pieces about pointing. Yeah. And I don't know, he said that uh, art is just about pointing out things. So the idea of then it's, uh, you were asking me earlier about art about art, mm -hmm. and so it's a little reference in my head about uh, John Baldessari piece, if you know it, about uh, pointing, paint, pointing paintings where he's pointing at things, and it's my inability to, to point at things. So it, I don't know, that's kind of, I don't know what the piece is about, but they're some of the things that led to making it, and then the kind of trust that it'll be okay kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know, that's rough, I don't know. That's as much as I know what it's about. But I think the evidence is a really good uh, mm. starting point for us, I think, for the show um, as a whole, but also in particular for, for this piece. Um, and I hope most of you have had a chance to sort of uh, go through this. Do you want to just sort of describe uh, what it is? Um, it's basic, it's very simple. It's basically um, an edited text of 1984, um, George Orwell book. Um, and it's edited back just to the love story that's in the book and it's kind of edited back to uh, almost the least amount it's obviously subjective if every no matter who would do this they would do it in a different way um, but for me it's like um, the least amount that will tell a story that will carry a narrative um, and so I've kind of tried to edit out um, um, any kind of uh, extraneous kind of descriptions of rooms or objects or the real world or the world uh, other than the world inhabited by the kind of internal of Julia and Winston. So it's really just their relationship. And Why did you feel compelled to, you know, of all the things in 1984, um, yeah. why did you feel compelled to bring that out? It's... Um, in a way, it's I don't I don't know. It's it's a subjective thing again. There's subjective reasons, and then there's also political reasons, and it's one of those things which is quoted all the time. Big Brother and yeah. Newspeak, and there's so many things which have entered the culture and the language from 1984. But you know, it's one of those. I think it's like one of the top books that everybody should read, but nobody does read. The amount of people who oh I must read that, but don't actually read it. But we all we can quote from it very easily with. Uh, obviously with Big Brothers watching you and all yeah. the different things that Orwell came up with. And then it is, it's basically Orwell's nightmare has come true in a way, um, in terms of surveillance culture and information and control of history and all the, all the other things which the book is about. And so in a way it's, um, when I reread the book, just to reread it, not to make a piece, it was the thing which popped out at me as the narrative that I'd forgotten about the first time I read it that, all oh, right, there's this love story which 
you don't think about when you're a teenager, when you read it, you're kind of more interested in all the political ideas yeah. in it. So this popped out as kind of this uh, making the, the, the personal political and the political personal and it's the relationship between those two things which are so important. No, I think, I think that, that, that's exactly my personal experience was, uh, you know, because I read the book probably as a 14, 15 yeah. year old and I, I didn't even remember the names, I didn't yeah. remember this, the yeah. subplot, which yeah, is yeah. the title of the piece at all. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I first came across this piece in uh, the Sharjah Biennial um, earlier this year in, in the UAE. Um, and uh, I was actually quite surprised because you know some of the bits there are, are a little bit racy, um, especially when you think about the UAE. Um, and for those of you who are connected or sort of read about the art world, you may possibly know that uh, the director of the Sharjah Biennial, Jack Persekian, uh, got into serious trouble and lost his job over at when it was initially tweeted was an unnamed piece. Uh, so having remembered that, oh, there were racy bits in here, and, you know, there's, God forbid, there's mm. marriage before sex. Uh, mm. Doesn't happen in the UAE, you know. Uh, like sex Ireland. before marriage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip, yeah. you know, I've been married too long, as you can tell. Uh, the sex before marriage, so, you know, obviously some shape has, uh, has, uh, has taken umbrage. Um, so I, my first reaction on hearing that uh, the director's being fired is, oh, so sorry to hear what happened. Was it Tom Malloy? <laughs> 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 um, and, uh, and I sort of, sort of think back at that email and cringe. Um, but uh, I didn't get a response. So you know, I quickly figured out mm. it wasn't. Um, but it deals with this whole idea of, uh, you know, of, of censorship. Mm. Uh, and, and what, what is worth you know, being censored and, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and who does that censorship. Mm -hmm. and, and now uh, the whole WikiLeaks scenario mm -hmm. playing mm -hmm. out and uh, the furore over what has been redacted mm -hmm. and, you know, and not redacting and who it puts who in danger. And if we look at um, some of the works in, in the exhibition, certainly in this room, um, they all sort of come together with, with ideas of erasure, uh, I suppose. And, and perhaps if we sort of turn next to uh, the um, almost white piece at the back, uh, you want to tell us about um, what that is? Yeah, it's, it's, um, and it's interesting that just the word redactions is like a nice way of saying censorship or yeah. withholding information. Yeah. And in a way, I'm censoring George Orwell as yeah. well, and it's his text, but by being an editor, you're also a censor, mm. or you're uh, maybe censor is the wrong word, but you are, you are controlling information. And, and Winston's job was to rewrite history; that he's constantly rewriting history in 1984. So it's like a, a, a it's a, um, it's like an enigma inside in a puzzle. That kind of idea. It's just layers of um, deception. I think in a way is part of this. But this is again. It's like a censorship as well in when you paint something white or you rub something out, you're destroying some image and it's iconoclastic as well, which is like, oh, it's like seen as a bad thing, um, like all the iconoclasts and destroying of images. And again, it's about censorship and control. So by being the artist, putting yourself and again, burning a book is like kind of a, again, the thing the liberal lefty Western artist doesn't do or human being doesn't do. So to, to tease that within yourself is like a, creating yourself as an iconoclast or a censor. So it's basically a sheet of stamps from the Third Reich from the 1930s. And it, there's images of Hitler profile on all the stamps. Um, and I've painted it out white. And there's swastikas and eagles around the edge on the border. And basically I've painted it out. Um, so I'm just left on the bottom the signatures of the the person who engraved it and the printer so they're, they're just people and in the middle it's the state print works Vienna so it could be anywhere it could be the state print works Dublin it could be it's just a functional place it's a factory it's a print works and these are ordinary people doing craft work um, but they sign a sheet of stamps uh, which has the, the face of Hitler on them and the idea of, of stamps or money or something which is um, sanctioned by the state. Once you have a stamp 
or once you have money, then you, you can call yourself a state. You're, what's it to say? If you have an airline, you call yourself a state. That's a the biennial. Yeah, 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 a biennial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's a bit yeah. like that. It's, a, it's, it's an erasure and it's a censorship. But it's also, it's the personal, again, it's like the small person who validates the system and the system validates them. And it's a kind of, you can see the stamps vaguely. I didn't paint them totally white because I wanted you to maybe investigate them, with visually investigate them to find out what's underneath this paint. So they're painted quite crudely, like I could paint them very flat, but they're painted reasonably crudely. So it could be any country, it could be any person signed these, any one of us could have signed these because we had that job, we were a printer, we were an engraver. Um, and then it could be, we can put whoever's profile we want on it. It could be today, and there is a kind of a, I suppose, a kind of proto-fascism that people will talk about in the world today, but we're generally in the Western world, we feel wealthy enough that it's not happening, but if there's a huge downturn in the economy, it's like everything is ripe for the 1930s again. There's that kind of sense in the world, maybe in a pessimistic way. But so it's kind of trying to deal with that is whose face do you want to put up on it? Um, who's going to sign this piece of paper? Um, so it's, I don't, that's as much as I kind of sure, no, no, thoughts around it. I don't know, I don't really know what a lot of things I make are about fully, but. I think you've expressed very clearly <laughs> okay. what, what, what right. that means. Yeah. So. But the question I was going to ask is if we draw the contrast between uh, uh, work here where you have erased but kind of left us clues. Yeah to the work there, where you have left us no clue, and you point blank refuse to tell me what the book was. Mm. Uh, um, yeah, it's a book, and yeah. it's in a box. It's a green book in a box, <laughs> and there's no text on it yeah. that you can read decipher yeah. the title. And so again, it's something that we just don't do. We don't burn books here. But So what happens if it, the artist who's meant to be, I don't know, the kind of whatever, the seer, the thinker, whatever it happens to be, does the opposite and burns a book um, and then puts it in a box and won't tell you what book it is. So it's, um, it's again, like a lot of people ask me, what's the book? And I, w I haven't told anyone what the and book you, is. You resist the temptation yeah, to yeah, say yeah, no, but, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, but I haven't yeah, said yeah, any yeah. book. Yeah. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a lot about, uh, yeah, uh, I've made other pieces which deal with uh, either images of Muhammad, images of books, whatever, but how you can um, uh, respect one person's culture that I don't understand or haven't come from, but also at the same time, how do I express myself with the freedom that I've been given in the West? Mm -hmm. So how do you put the two of those things together and, and open a dialogue about uh, the respect of another, cult another person's culture? Uh, and your your right to feel, um, and you end up with the Danish cartoons, which yeah. do, which you don't actually do that, mm -hmm. and you see the consequences of uh, it's. I'm not going to say they shouldn't publish them, but it's awful when you see somebody publish something and there's people killed in another part of the mm -hmm. world because of this. Is that worth it or not? So it's a kind of a, it's it's trying to create a, a, a dialogue around that. I don't want to. You know, it's it, that's what it's really about, as such. Yeah. Um, well, in, in, in all the three of the works we've discussed so far, you are taking the role of the censor. So, in a way, almost you um, you're working against time. Yeah. Of, you know, of the artist that's about. Yeah. You're almost sort of arguing for, what I wouldn't say self-censorship, but but censorship as a strategy for looking. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, about yeah. the politics of what you choose to cover yeah. and reveal. Yeah. Would that be fair? Um, way yeah, it is, yeah. It's a fair way to. It also has attracted me to me to take very obvious things, like yeah. a book, you burn it. Uh, it's like so obvious, it's so stupid. But then when you put it in a box that you make it inaccessible to somebody, that you can't actually access it to open, then that's the piece is really about the our inability to open the book, to see what the book is, um, to examine it only with our eyes and to bring all the other things you mentioned, the Quran, it could be the Bible, it could be... Tony Blair's biography. It, it could be anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's about what you bring to the party rather than what I give you for the party. Like, it's, it's really about the viewer. 
if they come from one culture, another culture, then they're going to project whatever it is they want into the book. And it's about create, like making something that's very obvious like that and creating a space for the viewer to uh, bring the meaning to the, to the piece, I think, is it, uh, I don't know, that's in lots of ways. And I'm sort of, I'm naturally staring at the, mm. the, the one piece um, in this exhibition, uh, Eraser, you've called it, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Reasons of not having people tittering when you say rubber. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But could you just tell us how you made that? Um, how I made it? It's, well, it's basically, um, it's a rubber eraser that's, um, I don't know, because I rub out things a lot. So yeah. you, I have lots of different rubbers and different ones will rub out different things. And so it's a tool. Um, and I was rubbing something out uh, and had half a rubber and the rest was perfectly clean in a wrapper. And when I took it out, it kind of reminded me of, I was saying to you earlier, some kind of minimalist sculpture that was being destroyed. One side looked like a Donald Judd or uh, and the other side was all dirty marks with graphite on it. And it, it intrigued me, this kind of division between the two things. Um, put it on a shelf and it's been in the studio for months. And then my partner just uh, came along and put it in graphite and said, it's finished now, that's it. It was like a problem to be solved. So it's covered in graphite. Um, so it's, it's a rubber that can't rub out. Um, if you try to rub out with it, which is to fix a mistake, to erase something, whatever, um, then you leave a mark with it. And it's like a palimpsest, or it leaves a trace of trying to erase. So it's like a gain a bit. It's almost like, a, I suppose, a Borges piece or something like that, that you're, you're trying to get rid of something. But the more you get rid of it, the, the more the marks more it it's leaves, leaving. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, again, it's a kind of a contradiction. It's like built in contradictions into it's a very also, simple I mean, it object. Also is, uh, and it struck me as to how, I mean, some of your, uh, you, you have made a lot of work about death, whether we talk about, you know, in yeah. different forms. So, you know, we talk about the, the, the Texan series yeah. or uh, uh, the, the, the skull, series about sorry. the, yeah, the yeah. skull, the suicide bombers, yeah, yeah. Um, about mourning. Yeah. Um, so there's, a, there's an element of, of this work which is mournful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's also, you know, apart from the fact that, oh, if you erase, you deem a mark, it's also the repository of, of everything that you've erased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, theoretically this, that, yeah. the other, but at least sort of conceptually you've, you've Yeah, it is, it is yeah. like a memento mori, yeah. mori, that it is just this object that it is deadly, there's no light reflecting from it, it's kind of gathering in light. And it is about that, yeah, in a, in a very simple, kind of unmonumental way, but it looks like it's a maquette for a big monument or something. It, there's something monumental about it that, uh, but the, I don't know, I, qu I quite like the ridiculousness of it as well, mm. that it's, it's a rubber that you buy in the shop and anybody can make it and everybody should make one for themselves kind of thing. It's like a, it's you know, a but very simple It sounds more ridiculous means. than it looks, because it doesn't look ridiculous. It, yeah. you know, it doesn't sort of, I haven't seen too many people Giggling yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. sort of seems uh, ominous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an ominous object. Yeah. Uh, and in a way, I, I suppose, with ominousness and you know, death, and we come to the first work that perhaps if you didn't pause for coffee, you may actually have overlooked, um, which is uh, as soon as you enter the gallery on your left, uh, and it's called Couple. Mm. And do you want to just tell us about? Um, it's kind of first you say it's the first work, but it's put there as the first work, but yeah. everybody comes in and it ends up being the last, the last work, yeah. which is very nice. And often that wall is quite nice to hang on because people miss it and they see it on the way out and go, oh, so it's kind of a, I kind of like that wall on it when it's on its own. So they're there on their own um, and they're a drawing of a couple. Um, and it's basically... Primi Levi and Diane Arbus, um, writer and photographer. And it's, the genesis of it is basically, um, I was reading a Primi Levi book at the time, and I was looking one night at a book of photographs of Diane Arbus, a big uh, catalog, resume catalog kind of, and it had her autopsy results, her autopsy report, she committed suicide, she had her autopsy report in the book um, and 
straight away then you're saying that's oh, quite strange you're reading a book about a, a, a writer and he killed himself after being in Aus in and was in Auschwitz or I'm not sure which camp but he survived camps and killed himself then in the 1980s um, and she photographed outsiders mm -hmm. and opened up that idea of a kind of a respectful representation of outsiders rather than rather than treating people as freaks or locking people away because we don't want to look at them uh, and her work was quite controversial people there's lots of arguments around respect for her subject matters and all the rest of it um, but both of them killed themselves and it was basically that's the that's why I put them together and it's when you think about it um, it was both of them were contemporaries their lives would have all overlapped for a number of years but not totally no, contemporaries yeah. yeah and the photograph of Premier Levy is probably from the 30s 20s 1930s and the Diane Arbus is kind of from the 60s so the, there's an incongruity between the photographs that I've worked from um, and I didn't want to make them, but is it incongruity? Maybe it, I wanted to put them as a couple, as if they were a married couple, and they could have been a married couple if they'd met each other by chance, like Winston and Julia meet each other by chance. Um, so there's this thing they lived in different parts of the world, and it's just that idea of life being about chance, taking uh, opportunities when chance arrives, um, that you don't know what's around the corner, but these people never met, and it's you put them together about the possibility like anybody could have met anybody else and then their life would have gone somewhere else maybe if they'd met they wouldn't have killed each other maybe oh. you know it's so it's it's a kind of a I don't know what it's about really other than it's a kind of a it feels about right and it feels about right if you've read this and then you go out there these become Winston and Julia oh. um, so it's kind of I don't know that's and it kind of maybe it ties in obviously then with Prima Levy definitely with the Hitler things and the burnt book oh. and Erase. So there's, uh, and I think it's kind of like a memento mora as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the other thing it does is uh, brings in the photograph yeah. uh, into this body of work, and and you know, photography is something that you've actually used a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when when I was first asked to say, oh, would you like to do this talk? I said, I'd love to, but I'm sure there'll be people in the audience who know more about Tom's work than I do. Mm. Um, and uh, so helpfully, I was sent a, a catalog, which I, if, you, if you don't know about, as much about Tom's work as I do, then a good way of finding out is read this essay by Katerina Gregos, uh, which is brilliant. And one of the things that she talks about is uh, photography um, mm. uh, and, and you know, how you've looked at the photograph mm. um, and, and, and in terms of sort of drawing um, with, uh, with, with photographs. And, um, and one of the things we were just talking about earlier is because, in a way, uh, you know, we've all grown up with this cliche of uh, a photograph is worth a thousand words. Uh, but you know, that may have been true in when Primo Levi was then in his prime, but it's not now. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the tabloid photograph is worth about ten words tops. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in a way, I see your drawing practice uh, as a way of pushing back that ratio. Mm -hmm. of, of trying to make that photograph, well, perhaps if mm -hmm. it's not a thousand, at least five hundred. Yeah, trying yeah, yeah. to return the photograph yeah. to the photograph. Yeah, it's like a, it's it, I don't know. It's something that I kind of look at the, and then so many artists draw from photographs now and draw in uh, not just an interpretive way, but in a a, 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 a yeah, 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 exactly to du yeah. to duplicate it. Mm -hmm. And what is that about? And it. To me, in lots of ways, um, it's about, uh, there's an evidence here, and it's about telling the truth. It's, the, 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 the drawing becomes truthful of the photograph, whereas the, I can't believe the photograph is truthful of reality. But at least if I make a drawing of it, I know I have a photograph, this is a truth from the photograph. Whereas when I pick up a, a photograph, because the photograph always lies now nearly, it's, it doesn't have that retention of truth anymore. The photograph for me in a newspaper or even a photograph we take ourselves and we go home and we change the contrast on a computer or a kid can do it or whatever, that it doesn't have that truth anymore. It, it might have a, a shock value or a, not a shock value but an initial truth, that a surprise truth.
but then maybe we may examine it or think about it more. And they're just the proliferation of imagery within our culture. It's so super saturated that it's, uh, they, they cancel each other out uh, much more than 100 years ago or 50 years ago or pre-digital. So to draw in a mimetic way from a photograph is to, uh, to nail it down in yeah. terms of whatever truth is in here, maybe I can find it, maybe I can... And also then it's a draw very, very slowly. Um, and again, I was talking to you earlier about time within work yeah. and how the visual arts, you bring time to it rather than a prescribed time within, within an image. Um, and so I, I kind of I have a thing in my head always that if you pay t enough attention to something, it'll pay attention back to you. And it's like if I draw it as slowly as possible, not as slowly as possible, mm. but as uh, I, I just draw very, very slowly. And my, uh, it's, uh, it's the, maybe the viewer then will pay attention to it. Will, it'll slow the viewer down um, to pay attention. And it's also, there's very little expressive mark making in things that I kind of try to eliminate ideas of self-expression um, in uh, in drawing sense I try to eliminate those well you try to eliminate people. a lot I mean I was just sort of uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to read some titles of Tom's work uh, Resolution Graven Lucid Dove Subplot Standard Edge Soapbox Map, Covenant. No, this is, I think, Burnt Book. Just Book. Book. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> it was Burnt Book for a while, yeah. but changed. Couple. <laughs> Eraser. So yeah. you get the drift. We, we are, we're talking about a man who thinks in one word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Waiting words. Mm. Uh, so text is obviously, uh, you know, apart from reclaiming the image, there's something about sort of an, uh, an economy of text. I mean, is this a... This is too much of a coincidence to say that no, it's not a strategy. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, it's not yeah. a strategy. But yeah. when when someone points it out, you yeah. realize, or when the guy was doing the design for this book or whatever, yeah. and then he did that, and he said, "Oh, you just do one words," and then I realize, "Oh shit, I just I do one words," and you know, it's not a strategy. And then you're, uh, but it is there, and they're not necessarily ambiguous words. But when they're seen no, they're with the, when they're words, yeah, yeah when they're seen with the piece, then you start to say. Oh, it can be read this way or that way, but maybe words are so slippery that when you pick them out and put them on a tweezers, they can all be read. That you know, they're not very good things at defining things, really. Yeah, they're, very dot. Totally. Yeah, 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 they're not. They're, yeah. they're almost more slippery yeah. than anything else. Yeah. Um, so they, they once you put them with a piece of visual work, they they start to slip all over the place, and then you again, it's an opportunity for the viewer to to say, what's going on here? How do I read the idea of standard? Just like there's. Ten, there's three, four, five definitions come to mind for what a standard is, um, and then the piece becomes. Uh, you can read, the, interpret the piece standard. It's a, just another. It's a sculptural piece. You can interpret it in three or four different ways. But I'm not telling you any more or any less. Um, and titles for me come sometimes quick, but often very, very slowly to arrive at the one word. It can be a long time, and it's not. I sit around thinking about it. But it's, uh, I don't know what to call that, but, but it, and then Josephine will ring up and say, what's that piece called? Uh, I don't know yet, It'll, I'll tell you when it comes. It's like, it's like that, uh, or I'll give her a title, but I'm not sure is that the title yet, don't tell anybody, and it'll come six months later. And it'll be a word, it's just, it's a very subjective way of titling things. Um, I don't know, that's, it's kind of ridiculous. But in a way, that, that's coming to post-facto. Yeah, most of the time yeah. it's post-facto, kind of, the titles. But something that then precedes, though, because one of the other things that you seem to take out, and this is where I, one point of disagreement that I have with, have with Katerina Gregos, mm. is where she talks about your work as lacking colour. Uh, yeah. And I should completely disagree with that, because mm. grey is a colour. <laughs> uh, so when I was being, you know, Kate was very kindly driving me from the airport mm. to here, and we saw the fire in the center of uh, it. You know, it looked like Dublin was being painted by you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it was. You know, mm. It's a Tom Malloy palette. Mm. Um, tell me about your relationship with Gray. Um, well, I was saying to you earlier, it's like I dare to quote that I like for color about color, and it's a cop out for not using yeah. color as uh, unless I need to use color. But it's like a, that color is just troubled light. 
and it's and once you kind of have that it's like no no but i'm sorry it's I'm, not like, gonna, I'm not gonna buy yeah, yeah. that and because it, no, it I, is a color gray yeah, is a color you could have done well, this in blue as well, well or, richter, or, or, richter paints all these gray yeah, canvases yeah. so he wouldn't have to deal like he's eliminated color well he keeps painting color but that was um well to me it's like the paper this paper is yellow it's warm it's a warm and these are cool it's i they're very subtle changes uh in terms of color the green book is important that it's green uh, it's the color of Islam, it's the color of hope, it could be the color of Ireland. You, it's like when I was looking for the right book to put in here, the, the, that was one of the criteria, if possible, to have a green book because it's uh, for those three those or reasons, four reasons. Yeah. yeah. So that's color and if that's, and then it's fortuitous when I burnt it that there's yellow and it could be Ireland, it could be green and yellow and with, uh, instead of white, it's black and that's just when it burnt it went a bit yellow so that's kind of color but it's serendipitous but uh, I don't know I kind of use color when I need to use color and I'm avoiding the question <laughs> well look gray is also a yeah. pencil which is yeah. uh, and I was sort of thanking Tom for you know because the sort of uh, uh, I'm doing a little mind map of uh, of some of your work and the sort of things that you deal with sort of media language memory maps uh, Official them in its various forms, whether it be stamps or uh, ma uh, or maps or declarations mm. or even money. Um, all these kinds of issues, which collectively, you know, really talk about how and what shapes our perception and how sort of power seems to be exercised mm -hmm. over us and by us. Mm -hmm. it, these are obviously you know big issues that a lot of artists uh, work with, but. A lot of them tend to work with video, and I almost mm. sort of feel like you know artists working with video need to apologize to their mm. audience uh, for the self-indulgence in, in asking so much time uh, mm. uh, uh, to deal with the subject. Mm. Whereas you've actually totally avoided video. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I've never I made video. No, no. So you've never done a video. Occasionally, I get an idea, but don't yeah. do it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Uh, um, not that I don't like mm. your answer, but I, I just find that your way of dealing with these issues um, and in sort of um, flying the flag for the, the humble pencil mm. um, is, is great. Because, you know, the pencil is such a... But it is, it is yeah. you go back to the colour thing and yeah. also the, the, with that, it's, um, I don't know, mark making is, they're cross hatches. Yeah. Um, they're... They're drawn like when I make drawings, I draw like traditional watercolors. I just build up things from dark to light, and I know what's white from the start. And it, it's Actually, like could you tell people how you did this? It's just a process of editing, photocopying, and then tracing out the letters, and then coloring them in. Yeah, so let's so it's very it. slow. Yeah. So you photocopy, you know, an open book. Yeah, and then edit it with tipex out, okay. on, and it kept. And my daughter at the time, um, I used to give it to her, and she yeah. hadn't read the book at the time. Um, so she would read it and say, mm, I don't know, I don't like this sentence. She was like a teenager at the time, so she was, in my way, my editor right. as, as well. So yeah. it was like she read it three, four, five times. So again, it was just a process of elimination, elimination to get to this, again, as I said, the kind of the, the least amount to sustain a narrative. Um, and then it's uh, put it on, put it on a light box, um, and trace them out very, very slowly, and cross hatch them in, and that's it. And how long did it take you? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes things take a long time, but yeah. they'll just take for a long time. No, but what's the long actual time draw? Yeah. A couple of years, maybe yeah. just thinking about it, and then saying, "All right, I go and do it." And the actual process is it, this is relatively quick, actually. Uh, I don't know, a couple of months maybe or something. Uh, I don't know. It's relatively quick. And the the, the act of mark making is is that? Um, do you sort of you know do yoga? I listen to the radio. Yeah, I was going to yeah, ask yeah. you. I mean, is it? Uh, I listen to talk radio. Is yeah. that it? And uh, yeah, mark making is important. Going back to the color thing to eliminate things. I only ever use ninety nine percent of the time. I only ever use a HB pencil, three mil thick. M mechanical pencil, so it's constant. I never 
try not to vary it, vary to, to uh, I'm not sure lost the word to uh, to leave that the parameters of that. Nine times out of ten, it's not this paper because they're traced, but it's a different paper. I use the same paper, so I know. Uh, I try and eliminate as much chance. Uh, chance happens in a different way, more, maybe in a thoughtful way or a serendipitous way. But I try within when materials. It's more about play than chance for me when I'm yeah. when I'm in the studio. Um, so it's like. Uh, yeah, I kind of know what things are going to look like before I start something. Well, I think these surprised me a little yeah. bit. They, they went somewhere else, um, which was nice. Sometimes they just they go somewhere else on their own when I'm drawn. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a routine. It's a daily practice like Richter as well. It's like yeah. a daily practice that's, uh, and it's not like a, a problem. It's just like, uh, you just do it. It's just what you do. Like, you know, well, thank you for indulging us. Yeah, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.